Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. You and a friend are looking for a place to live. You have a list of places and go to see a rental agent to check on a number of points. Listen to the conversation between your friend and the rental agent and complete the list. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hi, we've been looking over your listing of apartments for rent and we have a few questions about a couple of the apartments. Can you help us? Sure. Yep, this is our most recent listing. What would you like to know? Well, we were first wondering about the house on 3rd Street. We can see that it is furnished and rents for $135 a week, but can you tell us how many bedrooms it has? Let's see. In addition to the den, it has three bedrooms. The rental on 3rd Street has three bedrooms. So in the example, three bedrooms has been written down in the number of rooms column for 19 3rd Street. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hi, we've been looking over your listing of apartments for rent, and we have a few questions about a couple of the apartments. Can you help us? Sure. Yep, yeah, this is our most recent listing. What would you like to know? Well, we were first wondering about the house on 3rd Street. We can see that it is furnished and rents for $135 a week, but can you tell us how many bedrooms it has? Let's see. In addition to the den, it has three bedrooms. What about the one on Route 9N? It looks like it's big with a library and a deck, but it doesn't say how much it costs or anything else about it. Oh yes, Mrs Gaylor's apartment. That one is actually only a 10-month rental, and it is going for $156 per week. It's quite a nice place. She only rents for 10 months each year because of horse racing season. Then her relatives all come to stay, so tenants have to move out. It's a little bit inconvenient, but past tenants have really enjoyed their stay there. Oh, well, we need it for a full year. I guess that one is out. How about the rental on Broen Drive? How many rooms does that one have? As it says on the list, it has two bedrooms and a private kitchen and bath. But it's actually a very small place. That's why it's a bit cheaper. Oh. Well then, what about the one that has three large rooms? Who is renting that property? That one is a good deal. Mr John Smith is renting it. But he's quite eccentric and he has a strict rule about no pets. How about cats? Nope. Absolutely no pets. Hmm. Well then, how about this studio apartment rented by Mr Bo Jensen? How is that one? That ad is actually a bit deceptive. The studio apartment is the whole upper floor of an older house. It's actually very large and, at $45 a week, quite affordable. And it's near campus. I think I'd like to check that one out. Do you have a telephone number that we can call? It's not on the list? Oh, it isn't. Here it is. You should ring area code 518 and then 543-7790. Thanks. I think I'll call on that one first. Your friend decides that he would like to talk to Mr. Bo Jensen. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Hello? 1512, Route 9. Yes. Is this Mr Jensen? Yes, it is. Can I help you? Yeah. We're studying here at university and we came across the rental information for the studio apartment that you're renting. Is it still available? Yes, of course. I actually just placed the ad and you're the first person to call. Is there anything you'd like to know about it? Yes, actually there is. As students, we are on the internet a lot and we heard that some homes in the area have high-speed connections. What type of connection do you have there now? Oh, <laughs> that's an interesting first question. But I guess I have heard that too. But we just have a phone line here. Nothing fancy. I think you can have a cable line installed, but it's just a phone line for now. OK. Well, maybe we can do that. What type of heating does the apartment have? Now, there's a more traditional question. We have oil heat here. It's an older house. That tends to be a little more expensive during the winter, right? Yeah, but there's nothing to do about it. It would cost too much for me to put in a gas heater. What else would you like to know about the apartment? Well, we heard it was quite big. Is it furnished? Actually, yes. I should have put that in the ad. It has an old couch and a couple chairs, a dining table, refrigerator, stove, and even a dishwasher. Does it have any beds? Yep, it has two. That sounds great. When is the apartment available? You can have it tomorrow night if you want. I just have to clean up a couple things before you get here. Do you want to come over and see it first? No, it sounds fine to us. I actually know the street too, so I know the area. We'll take it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an introductory speech to students at a summer school. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 14. Good morning everyone and welcome to Climb Summer School. Now, I know most of you have travelled a long way to get here and you're probably looking forward to settling into your rooms. So I promise I won't keep you long, but we've got to get through this very brief induction just to make your stay here as pleasurable as possible. Now, as you can see, while we're located very close to the centre of London, we're actually quite cut off from the main road and we've got plenty of space for our facilities and students. This was part of our founder's vision, Jasmine Klein, who thought that the best environment for teenage students would be a place that combines the comforts of a big cosmopolitan city with the beauty and serenity of a quiet, remote site. Now, back in 1983, when our school was founded, this all here was an abandoned warehouse and the classes were held in the main building that you can see over there. There were no trees, no conifers surrounding the property, there wasn't even a main gate. It took years and a great deal of effort to get our school to where it is today, and I'm sure that if you take a look at page 34 in your brochures, where you can find a picture of what the school used to look like back then, you'll agree that the changes we've made are more than impressive. But it's not just the facilities that make Climb Summer School special, obviously, and I'm certain you already know this. Over the following 10 weeks, 
you'll receive an assortment of classes on a variety of topics, ranging from language, literature and poetry to creative writing, communication and project management. All of these modules have been designed to improve your chances of getting a place in the universities of your choice while also giving you the opportunity to learn, excel and, of course, also socialise with people from all over the world. I can tell you, just among the 30 of you, we've got about 21 different nationalities. So what happens now? First of all, I'll be handing out a map of the premises for you to have a look at and explaining where everything is. Once we're done here, you'll all be taken to your rooms where you can unpack and relax for a couple of hours. And later on, we'll be having our first activity of the day, a mix and match lunch in the main hall, where you'll have the chance to meet your new classmates. Later on in the afternoon, we'll be handing out your first project assignments and splitting you into teams. And tonight, we'll be having our very first film night, starting with an early 20th century special. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 15 to 20. So, let's get on with the map. You've already got a version of it in your brochures, so if you can open them to the last page so we can have a look. Very well. As I showed you before, the actual school is right over there in the middle. That's where you'll be having most of your classes. Adjacent to it, you'll find the main hall, which is where we'll be hosting most events, such as today's lunch. On the left from the main building, you'll find a smaller building, which is where the accommodation and welfare offices are located. This is labelled as the garden office at the front, and it's easy to spot because it has a green door. Each of you is assigned to a different residence hall. We've got three residence halls in total, one on the left and two on the right. The one right next to the garden office is Ursula Hall, named after our founder's sister, while the other two are Peter Hall and William Hall. Now, as you can see, there are three more buildings to the left of the semicircle here, and one more building on the right-hand side, next to William Hall. So that one, which is shaped a bit like a dome, is the pavilion. This is where all your letters will be delivered, and in the basement floor you'll also find a laundrette. Please make sure you've got plenty of one-pound coins, as you'll need one for the washing machine and another for the dryer. And that row of buildings on the left... The one closest to us here at the gate is the canteen, where you'll be able to buy snacks as well as breakfast, lunch and dinner on days when we don't have an event with food provided. The next one is the gym, which is open from 7am to 8pm from Monday to Friday and until 10pm at the weekend. And the last building, right over there, is the study centre, where you'll find plenty of computers and books as well as a great selection of DVDs and magazines that you can borrow with only a small refundable deposit of £5. Now, please remember to keep your student card with you at all times as you'll need it to access most of these facilities. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between an interviewer and a professor. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 21 to 26. Today I'm here with Professor Nitik, who is our new university president. He has been a professor for 20 years and teaches many of the best classes on campus. I know many of you have had him as a teacher and know of his brilliance. Good morning, Professor Nitik. Thank you for stopping by the student station. Thank you for having me here. It is always great to get to meet many of the students who are involved with our school. I haven't been here since two years ago. Yes, I remember at that time you were still teaching every semester. Two years later, you are only teaching every once in a while. But it seems like you are still always busy. The administration world is just as busy as the teaching world for you. How do you stay in touch with the university, even with the change in your everyday duties? I try to stay in touch with what is popular with the university students. I usually spend time with as many students as I can. They usually give me insight into what the new concerns and beliefs are for the new generation. On top of that, I try to be as youthful as I can. I consider myself to be youthful, at least for my age. So I always have a good time and try to stay young. I try my best to not just be a teacher, but also participate in university life. Interesting. So, are you still doing lots of academic work, or are you mostly concentrating on administrative affairs? Well, I mostly do administrative affairs now, but that doesn't mean that I still don't have a very deep interest in academic matters. I often visit other campuses around the world and meet other professors in my field. I learn the most by travelling and seeing the different places of the world and the different fields of thought. I even did a television programme last month in Manchester. Will you be on television any time soon, then? Well, you can call the television station and see if I will be on television any time soon. Maybe I will be on the news report. I don't think it is really that significant, though. Oh, really? That sounds great. I will remember to look out for you. Let's move on. With all your busy travelling recently, how do you find time for your personal life? I try to keep my university life separate from my personal life. Sometimes it's hard to find time to just take my wife and three kids out for a family dinner, but usually we all manage to get together every few days. I'm taking a few weeks off next month to take my family down to South America, to Brazil for a few days. I can't wait to just sit on the beach. Wow, that sounds like a wonderful trip. Professor Nitik, could you tell the audience a little about what goes on in an average day of a university administrator? <laughs> An average day? Oh, I don't think there is such thing as an average day for me. The last few weeks I've been travelling all the time. I can be in Los Angeles in the morning and in New York by the afternoon and back to Los Angeles by the evening. Sometimes I will spend the whole week at a new university, showing the new administrators the ins and outs of running a university. Sometimes I can spend the whole day in the office on the phone. So there really is no average day for me. I guess that is because I do so many different tasks. Sorry to let all the viewers down, but that is the plain truth. Now look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 27 to 30. Well, I guess I can sum it up for them. You are a busy man. That is probably a good description. So, are there any immediate plans for the coming few weeks? 
Well, I'm in Los Angeles for the next two days, and then I fly to Colorado to meet a new prospective professor for our university. I will be in Colorado for about a week. Then I go to Japan for the next ten days to meet with our university branch in Japan about record sales there. After that, I return to Los Angeles for a week, just in time for the graduation of the class of two thousand and one. There you have it, my next month's schedule. Thank you very much, Professor Nitik. I always enjoy having you on our show. We hope to have you back on our show next time. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about English language. You have thirty seconds to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-seven. Those of you who were here last week will remember that we talked about the journey of the English language from its early Indo-European origins through to Old English, Middle English, and then to Early and Late Modern English before it reached the form that it has today. Today, we will be continuing that theme by focusing on the future of the English language and all the places it might go from here. There are about 2.1 billion people around the world who can speak English. Out of these. Only 400 million are native speakers, which means that four in five English speakers are non-natives. This is obviously quite an impressive number, considering that just two centuries ago, in 1801, there were only about 20 million speakers of English around the world, and languages like French and German were ahead of English in terms of how many people were using them. But what does it mean? What it means is that the future of the English language doesn't really depend on its native speakers, but on that massive number of non-native speakers learning it around the world. Has everyone has anyone heard the term pidgin before or creole? A pidgin is a simplified version of a language which acts as a bridge between two people who don't have a common language, allowing them to communicate with each other. While a creole is a language that evolves from a pidgin, with the difference that it is fully formed with clear grammatical rules and vocabulary, there are currently dozens of pidgin and creole languages based on English around the world. For example, Nigerian pidgin or Jamaican patois. These languages are also known as Englishes. What's interesting about these Englishes is how different they sound to, for lack of a better term, proper English. Take the word trousers, for instance. In Sheng, which is a Kenyan Creole language, they're called longi because they're long. But even versions of English that are recognized as official variations or dialects still differ greatly from each other. Americans and Jamaicans would call the back of a car where you store your luggage the trunk. Britons, Australians, Canadians, and other Commonwealth countries would call it the boot. A subway in the UK is a tunnel under a road that allows pedestrians to cross safely. In the US, it's an underground train. You might think of these differences as minute, but when you take into account the dozens of different versions of English out there, a very intriguing parallel arises with another language from the past, Latin. Latin too used to be a lingua franca. Nowadays, it's all but dead, spoken only by a few clerics and scholars. 
At some point in history, it splintered into various different languages, which became known as Romance languages. For example, Spanish, Italian, or French. There are some that theorize that the same thing might happen to English in the near or distant future. That all these Englishes we have today in different countries will continue to develop, so pidgins will turn into Creole languages, and Creole languages will turn into just languages, and English itself, as we know it today, will disappear, or become less and less important. It's an interesting theory, if nothing else. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 38 to 40. It makes sense that, as English grows in popularity, countries, especially those with a strong sense of identity and tradition, will develop their own versions of the language, marked by the idiosyncrasies of their culture. Just think of the contribution of dialects such as Jamaican or South African English. In the past 50 years alone, they've added about 25,000 words to the English language. Most of these related to a local context, that wouldn't have existed in English before the spread of colonialism. In terms of numbers, just those are enough for a brand new language. There are some flaws to this theory too, however. While it's true that Latin and English have a lot of similarities in terms of how they developed or have developed throughout history, there is one big difference. We currently live in an era of globalization. Today, you can be in India and stream an American film or TV series in seconds. You can be in Nigeria and listen to British music. You can be in Brazil and read a novel from an Australian author. Just a few centuries ago, this was unthinkable. So what's the other way that English could go? According to some experts, there is the possibility that it could maintain its status as the world's global language, but with a few differences. Already today, most conversations in English occur between non-native speakers. While many of these might be fluent, the majority probably only have an intermediate understanding of the language, devoid of the nuances, colloquialisms, and complex collocations that native speakers employ in their interactions. This means that over time, English could turn into some sort of world-speak, the official lingua franca for the entire world, but in a simplified form. Some scholars have even started trying to develop that version of English by selecting the most useful words in the English vocabulary for non-native speakers to learn. Robert McCrum has compiled a comprehensive list of 1,500 words, for example, a version of English that he calls globish. And what about traditional native speaker English? It might continue to exist, but lose its popularity, as the previous theory suggests. There are many more theories about the future of the English language, of course. I've only focused on the two main ones, because they clearly demonstrate our uncertainty when it comes to how this beautiful language will develop. English is in a unique, unprecedented position. No other language has achieved the same levels of popularity in human history, especially in terms of non-native speakers. So, as this is clearly uncharted territory, only time will be able to tell us what will happen. That is the end of part four.